All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I am Marcelino Nogueiro, current president of the Golden Gate Computer Society. And uh, we, this is our monthly uh, meeting. So um, we will be, uh, you know, doing our thing here. I think we've kind of uh, been chatting here for a minute offline. Um, but uh, if anybody has any uh, questions that's uh, present here, um, go ahead and you know, speak up now. Also, Karen, uh, did you want to say anything about the uh, internet and more sake? I, that, I know you've been doing Zoom for that. I'm sorry, sorry I missed, I missed uh, this month. But, um, okay. Uh, I don't know yet what we're talking about this time, but I will come up with something good. Maybe it'll be trying some new flying software. Okay. <laughs> They've been subpar. I don't like the landings. I mean, the approaches, you can't see very well. Oh, I see. But somebody may have an idea of some good flying software. Yeah, I, we'll, we'll find out. We're gonna be talking about some of that flying type stuff today. Um, also, Ron, I don't know if your audio is working now, but did you wanna say anything about the, um, the school support SIG? Um, I, have you guys gone back uh, online on that or you're still uh, not going into the meeting, into the, I mean, into the shop? Um, maybe I think he's looking. He's looking at trying to get his audio to work still. All right. Well, maybe we can uh, get a, get some feedback from you oh, on school. Now. John, there we go. Uh, Good. On the list. No, no audio from from uh, Ron at this point. Okay, we'll uh, we'll move on. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and Ron. Uh, did you get your audio working or not? I didn't. Well, well we can we hear you just hear you. Did you hear that? Yeah, There's we can barely. hear you. It's a little weak, but we can hear you. No, no now you're muted completely. So unmute yourself first. That. Yeah, okay. We kind of hear you. That's about as good as it gets. All right. Well, we'll have to work on Maybe uh, some of the other school support guys can uh, work on the hardware on your computer. Yeah, uh, you uh, know, actually, we haven't. We're not going to the. We, we have to schedule who goes to the school support, and um, okay. Just to keep the distancing down, we coordinate through John Foot. Right, yeah, that's that's been the normal uh, type thing. So, hey, yeah, Ron? They, they adjusting to the new normal. Go ahead, Karen. Ron, when, we, when you actually figure out why you couldn't turn the volume up, would you let me know, please? Because I had somebody that I was on a Zoom call with and I did every bit of troubleshooting that I could do and we still couldn't figure out why they couldn't turn their volume up. So when you figure out an answer, would you mind letting me know, please? And actually, it's not the actual volume, it's actually the, micro, the microphone uh, signal level. Right. Because the, the speaker volume is completely separate. Well, not completely, but it is a separate volume adjustment which you can adjust on your on your speakers, you know, directly. So, right. I meant microphone. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker, um, Kent. And actually, Kent, I, I, I was going to have uh, Ron go through and say a little bit more about you uh, than what I know. Uh, so, we're going to have to uh, wing it here and I'll let you uh, introduce yourself. Sorry about that. But, no problem. Uh, Welcome, and uh, let's go ahead and listen to the, the to to what Ken has to say. Okay, before we start, everybody can hear me, right? I don't have Ron's I don't have Ron's problem. Okay, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure of that. Um, my name's Ken Dutro. I was asked by Ron uh, to come here and speak to you. I uh, belong to uh, what's called Sirs, uh, Sons in Retirement, and he was uh, at uh, one of our meetings, whereas I was speaking for Branch 47. So he invited me here and I said, sure, no problem. The only thing he asked me is I don't make my speech as technical as I did over there and talk more a little bit more about the, the computer uh, upgrades and history and uh, uh, full heartedly things going on at the, the center. So I am going to throw a lot more computer stuff in there with it and uh, the, the learning curves we had to go through and the, the system uh, installations and all that. Um, I got a presentation here, so let me get it started up. 
Okay, and I got to share the screen. Oh, you know what? I may need to uh, hang on one second. Okay. Oh, you're good. You're yeah. coming on. All right. So everybody can see the screen. All right. Yeah. So. Uh, my original uh, talk is air traffic control in the North Bay, and the reason I picked this subject is I worked over the, uh, the bay, and um, all of our uh, SIR branches were from the Marin County area, and that's where predominantly I did all my work there. So I give a quick history of myself, and um, yes, I did look this good at one time. Um, <laughs> 1975, I uh, joined the Marine Corps. I was originally going to be joining the Navy, and uh, the Marine Corps got me instead because uh, the, the recruiter was able to talk me into it. Um, I was in the Marine Corps for eight years total, four years uh, with the, the ground pounders and uh, four years with the air wing. Uh, two years into my enlistment, uh, I figured out I could not be a machine gunner for the rest of my life, so... Uh, I wanted to re-enlist to get a better uh, job and I didn't know what to do. And we were in the barracks one day and there was a pirate, uh, one of my friends was a private pilot. And he goes, why don't you be an air traffic controller? And I go, what the hell is that? He goes, oh, you talk to airplanes. This is, sounds good to me. So when I went to the recruiter and asked him if I could re-enlist and become an air traffic controller, he said, yeah, no problem. Uh, you just have to go to school. And if you pass that, then you can become a controller. So I, um, at four years in, I uh, went to uh, Millington, Tennessee and uh, took the A school and uh, passed it with flying colors and became an air traffic controller. And I was supposed to be going to El Toro and uh, they didn't have enough room at El Toro for anybody. So they asked me where else I'd like to go. And I says, well, what other options you got? He says, well, we got 29 Palms. I says, where's 29 Palms? He goes, oh, it's only 60 miles east of El Toro. I said, sure, I'll take that. I'm from Northern California. I didn't know where anything was in Southern California. Well, 29 Palms, as you can figure out, is a desert. And it is in the high desert. It's uh, on uh, Highway 60 north of Palm Springs, and there's absolutely nothing out there. The airfield is literally a, an aluminum runway, eight, um, was 10,000 feet long, 300 foot wide, and it's got a parallel taxi and a parking way, and there was 185 thousand sheets of aluminum that were three uh, feet wide, 12 feet long by three inches thick. And uh, we worked uh, from portable towers, uh, generators, our radar system was in a van, our fuel bladders were big rubber bladders out there. We had a resting gear. It was um, an expeditionary airfield. And that's where I learned initially how to do air traffic control. For, I would say, Three months at a time, we had absolutely nothing, zero airplanes. We didn't have any station aircraft. So I learned air traffic control by looking out the window and doing nothing. Then uh, they would come up for training exercises and all the aircraft that would come up for training exercise have no idea about the airfield because they were learning how to work at an expedition airfield. So we would go 24 seven for two weeks, screaming and yelling and absolutely not knowing what we were doing and airplanes just flying everywhere and bombing everything. Uh, so in order to get us trained, they sent us down to Tustin, which I found out was five miles from El Toro. But do you think the placement officer told me about Tustin? No. I went to Tustin, and that's where this picture is from. It's a helicopter base. And this is where I really learned how to control airplanes. Everybody believes that a helicopter can stop in midair. It can't. It's moving forward a little too quick. So you learn how to sequence aircraft and um, work your butt off. Uh, from there, I went uh, to uh, Iwakuni, Japan for my last year. I was going to re-enlist again, but as you know, in 1981, uh, they had a strike at the FAA, and Reagan fired 14,500 controllers on the spot. I'm and the, the military filled, was filling gaps quickly. However, I never got to do it because I was at 29 Palms, which was considered a critical base, so they didn't let me go there. So my plan in life was to go 20 years in the Marine Corps and then join Department of Defense and um, work as a controller instructor because every military tower has a, uh, a civilian controller there to keep continuity, usually about three of them. So that was my plan. And um, Department of Defense was the only people that would hire air traffic controllers beyond of age 31. So I was planning on you know, retiring at 37 from the Marine Corps and then doing more time with the uh, Department of Defense. However, since the Department of Defense was losing so many people to the FAA due to the strike, they lowered their hiring age to 31 to freeze anybody trying to leave. 
So now I had a dilemma. Do I want to be a controller or do I want to be a Marine? Well, I decided I wanted to be a controller more, so I left the Marine Corps after eight years. Little I know, three years later, they re-upped the age back up to whatever. So I could have stayed with the Corps, but uh, I decided to get out at that time. Uh, I got out of the Marine Corps June 10th, 1983, spent a year doing diddly-daddly and, uh, you know, construction here and there and goofing off, taking tests, trying to get hired and meeting my future wife. So it was a pretty good year. Uh, 1984, I uh, got hired by the, the FAA, and uh, my hiring was I was working in Piedmont on a Friday afternoon, uh, rebuilding a gas station into a bagel bakery, and my wife comes racing in and says, uh, the FAA just called. They said, if you can be in Oklahoma City by Monday, you're hired. I have never moved so fast in my life going to a place I've never been before. <laughs> showed up in Oklahoma City Monday morning. Actually, I showed up uh, Sunday night found the apartment I had hastily, this was before the internet, you know, we got to remember this is 1984. So there is no, oh, I can go look for a hotel online and stuff like that. No, they, they had a list of apartments that you could get. I found one. I got one on the same street the academy was on. So I figured I'd be close. No, I picked the farthest one away. It just happened to be on the same street that the academy was on. It was on the other end of Oklahoma City. So after I finished training there, I went to Oakland Center, which was my dream job. Um, I, I died for Oakland Center. I just wanted that job. When I first um, uh, was doing the interview, I was at San Francisco Tower for the interview, and uh, I did not put in the center because I was a tower controller my whole career, and I you know, put any Bay Area tower, and the guy says, well, how come you didn't pick the center? He says, I, could, I didn't think I could. And he goes, oh, no, no, you can pick it. I said, oh, wow, great, put it down. So he put it down in Oakland Center, which was my dream, uh, hired me in 84. I uh, went there. And uh, the first uh, 15 years at Oakland Center, I worked at the oceanic sectors. And uh, Oakland Center has 140,000 square miles of domestic airspace, which is under radar control. And here's the big number, it has 18.7 million square miles under oceanic control. We are the largest center in the world. We have more airspace than countries have. Um, so, uh, yeah, I worked at Oceanic, and I'll explain a little bit how Oceanic works here in a few minutes, uh, for 15 years, and then I went into domestic, which is the radar. In the domestic, I worked in the uh, northern half of the center, uh, so I worked uh, from basically the Richmond San Rafael Bridge north up to Mount Shasta, and uh, then I also worked the, uh, the Bay Area departures going eastbound, so that would be up to about the Battle Mountain, Nevada. Um, in 2008, I retired from the FAA, and so I have been gone for 12 years, so a lot of the information I have here is ancient history now. Um, so beginning with air traffic control, the way it starts, there's uh, 21 centers in the country. Actually, there's now 22, because I think Guam got reconfigured as a total center. Um, they are connected together with the, at that time when I first hired on, they were connected together with the IBM 9020 mainframe computer, and that was uh, the National Airspace System. And these computers would be uh, uh, linked up together and uh, they would uh, carry all the information on every flight plan on every aircraft that was flying within the, uh, the airspace. The software for this machine was originally written in 1960. And these were basically the same type of programmers that took Apollo to the moon. Uh, this was, hardcore programming. This was non, you know, it was, it was infallible, infallible uh, programming. You could not have an accident with this. So there was a liability issue. So they basically designed and built this um, programming that was just absolutely indestructible. It was, and you'll hear later on how indestructible it was. Uh, so uh, the 9020 was uh, in existence with us until 1989. And then it was taken over by the host computer. And uh, between uh, the 9020 and the host, IBM was contracted to uh, redesign the air traffic control uh, computer system, which was what they called the sector suites. And they originally started on a contract. And like any government contract, uh, they would uh, meet it. And then the government would put more uh, demands on it. They would want more and more and more, and the budget kept increasing, increasing, and it eventually it turned into a, like a $9 billion project, and it didn't work. 
And the reason it didn't work is because they could not accept the liability. Uh, the FAA could not accept IBM's writing of the new code. Uh, they could, the, they just could not accept liability because it wasn't as good as the old code. So what they did, they scrapped the whole system and they came up with the host system. And I'm not sure what the host stood for, but it's an acronym actually. Mm -hmm. And what it was, it was a 9020 emulator. It uh, ran everything, the 9020, the, the core software, and it ran it by lying to it. it you got all these fancy new features and it was running faster, much faster, but down in the core, it was basically doing manipulations on if, like for instance, if we wanted to send an aircraft direct with the computer, we would have to do an amendment to his flight plan by telling the computer what his position was, what time of day it was, and where he was going. And when the host came in, we were able to do a reroute without having to do the amendment by just sending him direct. But what the computer did was it would grab the position of the airplane off the scope. It would say the time of day and it would figure out the route and then tell the, uh, the core software what it was going on. So it was basically like being a, um, an interface between us and the core. The core, as far as I know, I was there until 2008. Up to at least 2004, the core was still there. I do not know for a fact if they ever rewrote it, but it was 1960s machine language programming that lasted until at least 2004. I remember it then because uh, the guy that was working on the computer that I was real good friends with said they were still doing it. So I was going to say about the, the centers. Um, now, the, the computing power of these, these mainframes was incredible because within the, each center, they would have to be also linked with all the towers and also with the approach controls. Uh, they, at the time when we heard this, we had several approach controls. We had Stockton, uh, Bay Approach, we had Monterey, we had Sacramento, and uh, I think Salinas, I'm not sure if there was one there. But, um, and then we had hundreds of towers everywhere. And, and the computer was all linked to them. Also at the time we had flight service stations. So if you wanted to file a flight plan, they would put it into the computer and they would do it with punch cards. They would do it with a teletype machine, things like that. Our, our data entry was basically almost the same entry soft or uh, mechanics that the Apollo space program had. We, we could literally put our heel into the keyboard and not break it. I mean, sometimes on the mid, you would see guys typing out flight plans with their heels just so that they didn't have to take their feet off the council. They would just bang on the thing and it would take it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was some strong stuff. When they brought up the new stuff, it was like we were all laughing at it. So how the hell is it going to survive us, you know, hitting on this stuff? Um, so, yeah, each, uh, each center, they are the owning airspace, and they, they own everything within their airspace. Um, if the military wants something, the FAA will give them a chunk of airspace. You might think it belongs to the military, but it doesn't. It belongs to the FAA. Even the president's so White House belongs to the FAA. Even though it's prohibited airspace and nobody can fly over it, the FAA decides who and what can move through that. Uh, the centers provide radar as separation to the in route aircraft and performs the duties also of an approach control where approach controls do not exist. Okay, so Oakland Center, this is where I worked. And you see to the left uh, in the numbers, basically 30s, and uh, that's the high altitude sectors. And I don't know if you can see a mouse or not, but if you look at sector 32 and you look at the left end of it, that's basically San Francisco. So that orientates you. If you look at sector 36, the southern end of it, the southern right corner of it is uh, basically San Pablo Bay. And then 35 is basically uh, the Golden Gate south down to about Monterey heading westbound. So if you want to orient that, also sector 43, if you look in the middle of it, there's a crosshair, that's Reno. So if that's how you can orientate the, the map. That's the airspace we had up north, Mount Shasta would be our northern limit. And down south, Avenal, if you know where the city of Avenal, about Kings, um, was it, uh, yeah, whatever, the I can't remember, it's King, King City? Yeah, King City, around that area. That's where we're south. And then west, we go all the way to Japan and the Philippines. So we'll show that a little bit. 
And then on the right hand uh, picture there, that's all the low altitude sectors. That's um, the airspace that works basically uh, 23,000 feet and below. And uh, if you look at sector 40 and 41, they were unique. Uh, 40 would work 9,000 feet and below, 41 would work 10 to, uh, to 23,000 feet. Um, 40 is where Napa, Santa Rosa, Ukiah, and um, all the Irwin, any small uncontrolled air place, um, Nosfield, that's all underneath that airspace. Uh, sector 42 was the other low altitude sector I would work. That is basically Chico, Redding, Red Bluff, Trinity. And then if you go up to the north, of, uh, about northwest of it, uh, just as you leave the boundaries is Arcata and Crescent City. And that's worked by Seattle Center. And a question. Can sure, you, go ahead. Can you explain the process from takeoff to uh, landing through uh, the tower and the radios and the centers? Sure. Um, you want me to do that right now? Because that, that's a pretty good place to start. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, as let's say, uh, we'll do a private pilot one. Uh, the airliners are a lot more automated, but a private pilot, the first thing they would do is they would go to, uh, it's now automated, but at one time there used to be actual facility where you go called the flight service station, but it's now automated. There's either a kiosk at the airport or you can do it online. And what you do is you'd enter a flight plan and that flight plan, you don't have to, but this is, you're, you're asking about how you go from step to step. So I'm going to go with the flight plan. Um, you would file a flight plan and you could either do it VFR, which is visual flight rules, which is basically you're in charge of separation and uh, the FAA is going to follow you. Or you can do an IFR, which is an instrument flight rules. And that is you are under air traffic control the entire way. So if you want to fly, let's say from here to Reno and you want to do it IFR because you know it's going to be bad weather and you're going over the mountains and nothing scarier than bad weather going over the mountains. So you decide to file a, an IFR flight plan and you're at uh, Santa Rosa. You would uh, put your flight plan and there's a whole form. It's basically your, your call sign, your type aircraft, what your plan speed is, your route of flight and all that. You put that in and uh, it goes into the computer and the computer is tied to one of the 22 center or 21 centers domestically. And once the computer gets that, it calculates the route of flight and decides what sectors and what facilities beyond gets this flight plan. So it has it all figured out and it sends it through. Oh, yeah. And so you, you filed your flight plan, you got your airplane ready, and you get in your airplane. The first person you would talk to is called flight data. And flight data is basically uh, somebody who activates, closes out flight plans, and also issues flight plans. And if the tower's small enough, they'll issue weather and stuff like that. He's basically the flight information position in the tower. And you would tell the, the, the flight data that you know, you're gonna be ready here to departure and he will activate your flight plan and then give you the root clearance. And the root clearance is, is usually a standardized thing. If the, the flight plan's in the computer, the computer will spit out a clearance and the flight data will read the clearance to the pilot and tell him basically what he filed is what he gets. If, if he filed through a military airspace, the computer will reroute him and you'll get a new route and give it to the pilot. So the pilot gets his flight plan and he gets his initial altitudes and all that and he gets his frequencies. And from there, he'll contact ground control. Ground control basically owns everything on the ground except the runways. He does not own the runways, but he owns everything else. Um, if you're on a, a 747 out of San Francisco, this is the critical time. When your flight says it's going to depart at 8 o'clock, the pilot at exactly 8 o'clock will call up ground control and ask for pushback. And ground control will say pushback approved. You have now departed on time. According to all the 100% on time rulings that you hear an airline advertise, that is on time. It's not taking off from the runway, it is being pushed back. So if you push back, you're now on time. So now here you are, the pilot pilot again, back at Santa Rosa, and you get to ground control and you ask for taxi to uh, 
God, I wish I could remember the runways. Um, is uh, I think I think it's three one, but I'm not sure. Uh, Seventeen or something like that. But I wish I I know Oakland's, but Santa Rosa I can't remember. Um, so you would you would get uh, taxi instructions to the runway from ground control, and ground would monitor your movements, and you would taxi to the uh, to the appropriate runway. And just before getting the runway, ground will switch you to to locals frequency. Local is what. 98% of the country believes air traffic control is. This is the guy that says cleared for takeoff, cleared to land. He has absolutely nothing to do in that tower other than to say cleared for takeoff, cleared to land, and make sure nobody runs into each other in the air in a five mile diameter around a five mile radius around his airport. So you, he tells you when to get on the runway, when to take off, and which direction to, to go out. So, so you, you get, I have yeah. a question for you, Ken. So when, sure. when he's when he's I guess in the run up area, the the tower person also is the one that would just say taxi into position and hold because he's aware of whatever traffic. Yes, is he is he's the one nobody but the local will tell an aircraft to get on the runway. So usually what happens when you go into the run up area, ground will switch you over. You know, contact a tower, blah blah blah, you know, holding short. And, and whether you're in the run up area or on the line. You will not go onto the runway until local actually tells you. He's the only person that can do it. Um, so he will clear you for departure, clear to take off, give you the wind, the altimeter, and all that. And you will depart. And if you're going IFR, the first thing you're going to hear off departure is contact departure control. Now, coming off of Santa Rosa, you're not actually talking to departure control. You'd be talking to me. That would be sector 40. And I would be sitting there in the center, and you would come off. One of the things that you got in your flight plan is a transponder code. Now, this code is going to, we're just going to say one, two, three, four. Okay, it's a four digit code. You dial it into this box you have in your, your cockpit called the transponder. And this is what talks to ATC. Uh, if you ever look at the radar dish at Oakland Airport, or if you can find the one at San Francisco, because I still to this day don't know where the radar dish at San Francisco is. I think it's in somewhere in the field, but there's a bar that goes across the top and the, 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 the bottom half looks like a regular radar dish and the top there's a bar. That bar does the same functions of radar, other, but what it does, it interrogates that transponder box. And once it finds the code, 1234, it will put that code onto the, the controller's radar screen. So the computer will take the code see a radar target leaving the runway, associate the two together because it knows it's just a part of the flight plan and that code meets that flight plan and it'll tag that target now with a uh, what we call a data block. And a data block has the aircraft's call sign, its speed and its altitude. And then there's other special symbols that have only to do with air traffic control, whether or not they're under your control, somebody else's control, if they're handing off and stuff like that. But basically what you're looking at is the call sign, the speed, and the altitude. Ken? And yeah. Good question. When you sure. said that when you take off out of Santa Rosa, I know you said it if it's IRS, it'd say contact departure, blah blah blah. But right. if, if you're contact if, center. Yeah. If you're, if you're well okay. So if you're VFR then you would they would tell you guys would tell us contact Oakland, Oakland Center at whatever the frequency is. Uh, if you're VFR um, no, they'll just say, uh, you know, See you goodbye. Later. <laughs> yeah, goodbye. Uh, if you're VFR, no, the tower, unless you are in VFR flight following from the ground, which is very rare, yeah. but sometimes we do do it. No, they'll just switch you over and uh, you, it'll be your responsibility to switch over to center frequency and ask for flight following, which would be, I'll, I'll talk about that after I do the, the IFR portion. Okay. Okay, so you have the, the transponder scog, and all of a sudden the data block shows up on the radar scope at sector 40. Okay, since I know I have a departure going because I have the, the tower called me and asked for departure, and I cleared them for departure, they gave them the takeoff clearance. All of a sudden the data block comes up, and then the pilot checks in Oakland Center. This is November 12345, coming off of Santa Rosa, going to Reno. And, uh, you know, climbing to 4,000 or whatever altitude I sent them to, 4,000. 
I'll go November 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, open center radar contact, fly heading or proceed on course or clear direct, climb and maintain. I'll give you all the instructions you ever wanted. So now you are coming out into the system and you are being separated from other aircraft since you are IFR. So you have lots of uh, space around you and uh, rules going on. And I am, as a controller, putting in a lot of data. I am changing your altitude, so I'm uh, entering more data in the computer. The flight plans down the road are changing. Um, I'm handing you off now because you're not going to uh, Reno at 4,000 feet. You know, you have to go to a minimum of uh, 14,000 feet to clear the mountains. So you're going you're gonna to be going pretty high up. You're going to be going through different sectors. So what I'm working on is getting you to the, the base of the next sector, handing you off via computer. And the way we do that is coming off of sector 40, I would be climbing you to 9,000 feet because that's the base of my um, sector. And I would make sure you're not running into the Oakland arrivals, things like that. And I'd be handing you off to sector 41. 41 has 10,000 feet and above. And they would see this data block, the same data block I have, but all of a sudden it's now flashing on their scope. Uh, saying, you know, 41, 41, 41, and that means I'm handing it off to 41. Since they are 41, they'll slew onto the data block and they can hit enter. And that's one of the nice features of um, the computer is it recognizes the slew ball also. So if you slew over a target and it's got a nice little box on it, and if you get in that box, it'll do whatever you want with that slew ball. So it'll take the handoff. Once I see that the next sector above me has taken the handoff and I have absolutely nothing to do with the airplane anymore, I'll switch into his frequency. That'll continue on all the way to Reno. So what happens now is we are coming into Reno approach with a totally different facility from Oakland Center. Before we were just handing off between the sectors. Now we're coming to a different facility. So the, the computer has forwarded the flight plan to the facility. Back before 89, um, we could not hand off aircraft electronically to uh, another facility or other than a center. We could do centers or facilities that we had tie-ins, such as Bay Approach. They had a, they had a, a data link with the, within the centers, but we didn't have one with Reno. So at the time, somebody would have to call Reno saying, you know, uh, I have a such and such airplane, the flight plan, and his code is. And he'll look at his scope and he'll see the code because uh, the radar scope shows all targets and their transponders. So even though they don't have a data block on it, they still have a faint transponder single. So they have that code one, two, three, four, five moving along the screen. They can see the target with that so they can radar accept it. So they'll say radar contact. And then we'll tell the, uh, the pilot uh, that um, he can contact Reno Approach. Now, if Reno Approach could not get a radar uh, on him, for instance, uh, they could not actually see the radar image. They would have to do a non-radar handoff. And then what would happen is we would tell the pilot radar services is terminated, contact Reno Approach. That does not mean his flight plan is terminated. He's just not being serviced by a radar anymore. He's still flying his IFR flight plan. However, now the separation increases because he doesn't have that nice radar bubble. He's uh, doing non-radar and uh, we have to keep the aircraft more farther apart because we don't know exactly where the airplane's at. So if Reno gets the radar, then it's an easy thing. Then he just starts descending them and he puts them on approach. If he doesn't get the radar, then what he does is he keeps them coming in until he does see the target and he gets them on the route. Uh, one space, uh, a real quick thing where we could not uh, get radar handoffs was between Oakland and Seattle Center at Arcata below 10,000 feet. None of our radars worked there. So we were constantly doing this non-radar handoffs. And um, we, we would have to time the aircraft and figure out when he was going to cross the border and then uh, call up the center and then they would block the airspace waiting on him. So Reno Approach now has the airplane. They have a data block on them. The Approach Control's data block's a little slimmer. It's a little, uh, it moves a little quicker there because uh, they don't keep the aircraft half as long as we did. They will either vector the aircraft or let him run on his route of flight. If you're a jerk controller, you let him run on his route of flight. Or if a guy's training, you let him on his route of flight. But if it's like normal people who want to get there in a hurry, they're asking for direct routes. They're asking for vectors for approach. So you will turn the aircraft to the intercept the approach well within the design force of what his flight plan was because the flight plans are basically filed on 
nav aids that were established in the 30s and the 40s. Uh, we we have not moved those nav aids to this day. You know, we still haven't moved those nav aids, and people are still filing flight plans to them. And as soon as they get airborne, they're saying, "I want to go direct Chicago." You know, and but their route of flight is bang, bang, bang all over because there is no line of nav aids that goes direct to Chicago. So your your day is constantly spent on getting guys going direct places because nobody wants you to fly on the route of flight that you have to file. So uh, approach controls almost regularly are vectoring aircraft. They don't allow aircraft to run their route of flight because it would take too long. You would get vectored to the approach. Uh, depending on what the weather is, you can either be going in visually or you can be uh, vectored on to an ILS, which is an instrument landing system. Uh, you can have a, some facilities. I don't know if there's still any in the FAA, but I know the military has a lot where they have a radar approach, um, what's a precision approach uh, radar, which is a PAR, which is uh, some guy that sits there and verbally tells you if you're on course and flight path or flight path and all that. Um, and then from the approach control, you would be shipped over to local control again. And that's within about three miles of the airport. And local will see you coming in. Depending on his traffic, he'll tell you to clear the land or continue inbound. He'll start sequencing you. And you get the, the clearance to land. Once you hit the runway, um, you're switched over to ground control again. And as soon as you clear the runway, ground control takes over from you and takes you to your parking spot. And when you reach your parking spot, flight data will now close out your flight plan or whoever is in charge at the airport will close out the flight plan and the whole system's done. If you're BFR now and you come off of Santa Rosa and you want to go to Palo Alto, for instance, uh, you pop up and what your, tra your transponder is squawking is 1200, 1200. That's a standard BFR code throughout the FAA. And what that does on a radar screen, which is really nice for the controller, it puts a big B on the target. So I can see every airplane in North Bay, Napa County Airport. On, I mean, you see a Saturday out there, everybody's flying around. And you see, you see a lot of Ds and then a whole bunch of these little dots. And the little dots are the guys who are just going up there and they don't care about you at all. They're the, you know, they're the powered hand gliders. They're the people going out doing acrobatics or whatever fun or John and Mary are flying over the vineyards to take a look at them. But the, the V guys are the ones that you know you're going to be dealing with because these guys know what's going on. Uh, usually what they want to do is they want to go to, through a TCA. And the easiest way to go through a TCA is to get with a controller. Easiest way to get in the Bay's airspace is to get with Sector 40. Sector 40 is a, a nice sponge that if you depart off the North Bay and you get into the sky and you call up center and say, open center, this is November 1, 2, 3, 4. I'd like flight following a T TCA penetration to Palo Alto. You know, and I go, Roger, and it says squawk one, two, three, four, five. And you will go to your transponder and you'll dial in one, two, three, four, five. And while you're doing that, I'm sitting at my scope at the, the screen and I'm typing in who you are because you told me your call sign and your type aircraft and where you're going. And I can put that in real quick with what's called a VP flight plan. And all I have to do is type VP call sign, um, your squawk code and where you're going. And as soon as your code comes up, my computer will see your code and tag a flight or a data block to it. Now I have a, a, a VFR flight plan and this computer, since it's going to Palo Alto, will all of a sudden send the flight plan to NorCal. So now NorCal knows you're coming to Palo Alto. NorCal has no idea who's who. They don't know an IFR aircraft from a VFR aircraft. All they know is that targets are coming at them. Call, you know, data blocks. If, if center's handing a data block off to them, they must take it. It's, it's an unwritten law. They, it, I, I think in my entire career at Oakland Center, I was told one time to keep the airplanes out of their airspace. And that was because they were just thoroughly saturated due to bad weather. I mean, incredibly bad weather. And we were told, keep your, you know, no more VFR aircraft coming in. So, um, yeah, you just hand off a data block and then we'll ship them, uh, put them on their frequency. And basically, uh, they will give you a class Bravo clearance. And a class Bravo clearance basically gets you through the TCA to your airport via whatever route they tell you. And it's usually a very simple standardized route. There is really nothing complicated because the last thing they want is a, 
a small pilot, a small aircraft pilot, wandering around trying to figure out where they're supposed to go. So it's usually uh, done with landmarks and things like that. It's never what we call an IFR flight plan. If you have an IFR flight plan, you don't need TCA penetration. That's already included in your flight plan. For a VFR one, they give you a simple route of flight, like you know, stay on the west side of Oakland on the freeway or something like this. They'll tell you to follow uh, geographical points. Um, uh, quick, quick question over here. Sure. Um, so you're talking about you know how you communicate with all these uh, people. I can understand. You know, obviously communicating with the pilots is going to be radio. Right. But when you're doing the handoffs and things like that from one, you know, one controller to another, is that happening on radio frequencies or is that landline? Or nowadays, is there like uh, internet connectivity that you have to rely on um, for these things to work? How's that portion, uh, you know? Handoffs are done predominantly via. Uh, I, networking. I was gonna, I was gonna say Wi-Fi, but no, it's networking. Um, if I if I put in the the sector's identification for the aircraft I want to hand them off to, for instance, if I want to hand them off the bay, it would be an R for the the sector that I used to deal with. I would put an R, and I would slew onto the data, the data block, and I hit enter, and it would start handing off to the Richmond sector, and okay. the Richmond sector would see this data block flashing on his scope. And if he slews onto it and punches the data block, he has now accepted the handoff. He has, he has control of the data block. I can't do anything with the data block anymore. He has total control of it. Now, if you're doing what I would say a non-radar handoff, then it's over the landline. I would be calling him on the landline. And we have what, what's basically hot keys for sectors that are near and dear to us that we work with a lot for individual sectors. They're hot keys. You just press it and you're yelling right over their, it's never into their headset. It's always on the, the overhead. You, they can hear, basically the whole room can hear you calling. And then what they when they engage it, then it goes to their headset. So you're never interfering with another controller's work. He hears it in the background. As soon as he hears, uh, you know, Richmond, this is 41. And he hears that, he knows to press the 41 button. And once he does, then I go to his ear and his uh, aircraft are locked out now. It's just me and him talking. I relay my information. He says, thank you, and he gets off, and he's back with the aircraft. Is that all happening through, you know, wired, you know, sort of, I, I'm trying to figure out what kind of a networking this is, because uh, we're going back many years ago. You're, you're talking in the 80s before the internet was a thing. So we, we, uh, we, we have, we have, a hardwired nuclear capable connection landline. Okay. okay. Our, now here's, here's what's been our radar images and all that come via microwave. Okay. So, so the radar, the radar up in Mill Valley, if you look at Mount Tam and you see those golf balls up there, yeah. they have a microwave tower on there that transmits a signal directly to Fremont where Oakland Center is at. And that's how the, uh, so the, the radar signals are directly tied in with microwave. The landlines are hardening case physical lines that go because uh, too many times the radio things can be interfered with. I mean, right. we, we've lost radios a lot just due to weather and all that. And whereas uh, where information transfer, because the, um, the computers also talk on fiber optics by a hardened landline and like i said they are nuclear capable uh, they are they are very deep and uh, we've had them cut a few times when they were doing like major upgrades to the facility and they were digging around the parking lot and actually dug up the the landlines once so that was a big mess so yeah um, yeah okay yeah but they're e even even today as far as you know they're not relying on some sort of internet connectivity to make this work because that would be scary right no we are we are isolated from the internet okay uh we we have no internet capability with the air traffic control system we have internet in the building but it's not it's directly separated what everything that belongs to the faa for the national airspace system is an isolated entity uh okay. we're not even we're not even tied in with the military we are completely isolated the only thing the military is getting 
is our radar data. That's why it's microwaved. That's why it's microwaved all different facilities. Um, for instance, on the West Coast, we have two air defense facilities. Um, I don't know where they're at, but one's called Sierra Pete up north in Seattle, and the other one, uh, I can't remember the name, but from Fresno. But they're the ones that uh, do the West Coast intercepts. So they get our radar data, but they do not get our landline data. So they, we have a separate landline to them, but they do, they're not part of the ATC system. I can't. Oh, yes. Uh, quick question. Is what, Oakland Center, you said, was in Fremont. Is that, it, was Oakland Approach and Oakland Departure there also? I don't actually have any idea where the different facilities were as far as, other than the towers and okay, ground. Yeah. Uh, Oakland Center was originally uh, in the, up to 1960 was at Oakland Airport, and uh, they were um, the upper floor of uh, the terminal building where the tower was at. And uh, then in 1960, they uh, built the Oakland Center, which is in Fremont. If you know where the Thornton Avenue exit is, yeah. and uh, just before you get to Blakeow Road, which crosses the freeway, but there's no exit, we're right there on uh, Blakeow. Uh, and it's a large facility, and you used to be able to tell where we were at because we had the big HF antenna sticking out on the freeway there, but it's oh, gone yeah. now. You do remember that antenna? Yeah, well, my grandma lived at Maori and Blakeau, so. Okay, yeah. We were, we were the, the big um, big brown building across the street from the cemetery on Blakeau, and uh, that building came in existence 1960. It's still there. Uh, in 1983, uh, they were going to close the facility down. Vince Maloney was the manager at the time. And what he did to save the facility, he took all the oceanic airspace from all from Los Angeles, Seattle, Anchorage, and Hawaii and brought it all to Oakland so that we had enough traffic count to keep ourselves active. And that's how we ended up with the 18.7 square uh, million square miles. Originally, the oceanic airspace was uh, around several facilities, but in 1983, they brought it all together. Um, yeah, I have a vague recollection of that. It, yeah, and that will be uh, the next part here because we okay. have some. So, but yeah. does that mean that Oakland Approach and Oakland Departure were also housed in oh. that? I, I forgot what your question was. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, okay. Bay, Bay Approach, which was uh, originally stationed at Oakland uh, Airport, which is uh, which was at the North Field. That's where Bay Approach was at. And uh, San Francisco worked with Bay Approach. So Bay Approach worked San Jose, Oakland, and San Francisco. Right. And uh, in, I was going to say 2002, we came up with what's called Nor Nor NorCal, which is the Northern California Approach Control. We have two facilities in California, SoCal and NorCal. And they took all the individual approach controls in the state and combined them into these two buildings. So NorCal has Sacramento Approach, Monterey Approach, Stockton Approach, Bay Approach, and yeah, I think that was all the facilities they took. They combined them into one building and then reorganized their airspace and put them under one computer. So they only we only have to talk with one facility now, and it's almost like a mini center except that their separation standards are different because um, on our radar in the center, we have what's called mosaic radar. And what it does, it takes information from different radars and puts them together and makes one picture. So our separation is a five mile diameter circle around an aircraft. Um, the approach controls, they use single site separation, which means they get all their data from one radar site only. So if you're working at the, um, the, the sectors now that used to be Bay Approach, you're working off the Oakland radar. And if you're uh, working the Sacramento sectors, you're working on the Sacramento. They don't have any overlapping radars within their sectors. Each sector is tied to one radar. And their separation is only three miles in diameter. And so the vertical is still the same. But you can uh, you can do it closer because the, the thing about the five miles is if it's getting data from two different radars, they're not quite sure where the target's at. It's got a, a bigger mass of where it could be at. So it gives it a couple of extra miles for separation. So, so uh, that departure, uh, was that in a completely different facility? Uh, departure control would, it would have been, well, let's, for instance, Bay Approach had several sectors within it and uh, departure and arrivals 
are usually the same or two different controllers working at the same exact sector. And one would be working departures and one would be working arrivals, but they would be having the same airspace and they'd be sitting side by side. Okay. And the majority of their traffic would be procedurally separated. And so they really wouldn't have to do anything with, uh, you know, working the arrivals with the departures because usually the departures are working one end of the runway and the arrivals are working the other end of the runway. Uh, they're usually, you know, you usually don't have arrivals going inbound as departures are up, coming up their face. It's kind of messy. Uh, Got a question yeah. for you. Sure, Ron. You mentioned microwaves. Uh, what happens in an earthquake and those microwave towers get um, shifted? If, if we lose radar data, um, we do, uh, what we do is we bust up our airspace very rapidly into adjoining facilities. Uh, we have never had it because um, we, we, I, you know, I gotta believe there's some kind of earthquake proofing to those towers and all that. But uh, if we lose radar uh, systems, uh, we would automatically take all our airspace and split it up uh, between different centers. Seattle Center would get our Northwest portion, Salt Lake City would get our Eastern portion. Los Angeles Center would get our southern portion, and what's now NorCal Approach would basically be working the center. Um, today, I mean, back in the day when I was working, it was a little bit more messier because we couldn't uh, configure computer uh, configure computers fast enough. But so, but today now every sector has its own computer, so every sector in the FAA can now be configured for any airspace. If I want to work New York uh, Lahardy Approach. If I can get the radar data into my scope, I can configure my sector to work it. So I, I can see the, the the map, the airports, you know, and all the, the information. My entire console would be set up to be working in New York. So nowadays, if we ever had to split up the airspace, Seattle Center in a heartbeat could just press buttons and have their sectors configured to start working our airspace. A lot of stuff would slow down because, you know, controllers aren't used to working that traffic. But um, yeah, microwaves, I have never seen it go. I mean, even during Loma Coreta, we never had a loss of radar. So um, I, I got to believe the towers are configured in some way to be able to, to take it. They're, they're pretty sturdy. Uh, but I, I, do not, I do not think we had any backups because I know a lot of times if we had a microwave interference and we lost radar, uh, and we get it back a few minutes or something like that, we could have other radars take over. Because we you got to remember, we had four radars in our facility for Oakland Center. So in, in, if it was the tower that failed at Oakland Center, then we would lose all radars. But if we lose individual radars, then other radars can take over for us. For instance, if we lost Mill Valley, uh, we would uh, lose basically what uh, the Napa area, we would basically shut down radar traffic because we wouldn't be able to see below 10,000 feet. But for instance, the uh, Redding radar could take all our high altitude stuff all the way to San Francisco. So if we're working up to you know, 20,000 feet above that, we can see the targets from there. We just can't see the, the lowish stuff. So microwave seems to be the pretty safe way. I've never really seen a full, out, you know, full outage, even during an earthquake. Um, any more questions? Yeah, quick question. Sure. Uh, obviously, you got the the all of the facilities have power backups and everything. Yes. But, I mean, what would it take? What kind of catastrophe would catastrophe would it take to actually shut down that system? I know that that everything got shut down during 9/11, but it wasn't that was by order, um, and everybody was just grounded. But it didn't actually shut down any facilities. Right. But, but would I mean? I don't know, if I, because I don't know where all the different facilities are, you know, with all the wildfires that are going on right now, and we do have earthquakes and, you know, like the areas of the country that get hurricanes and stuff like that, would they just be split up as you were just talking about if, if let's say, their, their center in, say, Houston got decimated, um, would they then get split up like you were just talking about the center here? Yes. Uh, every, every center in the country has a contingency plan to give up their airspace. Um, one way or another, they have everybody can give up their airspace. To kill a center, there's really only one way, and you hear it a lot on the news, is we have a computer failure. And 
we don't actually have a computer failure with our facility. We have a computer failure with the national um, airspace in processing flight plans. If, if our computer doesn't know what flight plans are coming because the national airspace, some, you know, like uh, you hear Los Angeles Center breaking down every so often. And what happens is they have lost the capability of sending flight plans on. And that's usually, that was basically the number one reason we always had computer failures. They could not send the flight plans only that our main processor was going down and we had to go to the backup processor. Uh, I don't know if it's changed now, but the backup processor was never ever able to send on flight plans. Uh, the flight plans was always covered by the main processor and the backup processor was um, basically to run the, the scopes and to run, the, you know, to identify targets and track the radar and present the, the displays and all that. That was, the, that was the only thing the backup could do. I mean, because they couldn't build two primaries. It would cost too much money. So they, their backup was smaller. So if the primary radar or primary computer went down for any reason, overheating, a glitch in the software, or you know the power loss or something, we'd go to the backup uh, computer, we'd lose the flight plan processing, and everything would come to a crawl because we couldn't get rid of the aircraft fast enough now because the next facility wouldn't know their flight plan. So everything would have to be done manually. Even though I could work the airplane normally on a radar screen, I would have to have a guy next to me calling the next facility, giving the entire route of flight for the airplane, the type of aircraft, you know, and all this stuff. And they would have to then put all the information into their computer and basically start the flight plan from their border on. And as soon as the aircraft comes across the border on frequency, he would be asking them a million questions to complete that information. To get it over as quickly as possible, we would give them the bare minimums, type aircraft, call sign, speed, and where he's going. And a lot of times we don't even give him routes. You know, we just tell him he's going to Chicago. And then they would have to go, okay, give me your route of flight. And, you know, most controllers say, screw that, you're clear direct. You know, let somebody else deal with it down the road. <laughs> and, the, and the closer he got to Chicago, the shorter his route got, so it was less to put in the computer. But that, that, that is really the only thing that actually kills centers. I mean, when you hear it on the news that Oakland Center or Los Angeles Center went into a complete shutdown, what happened was is that we were no longer processing flight plans. However, we are still separating airplanes. Uh, I have never in my life in 24 years ever been at a complete shutdown where, you know, everything went blank and, you know, we went to movie mode and everybody's screaming and hollering and, you know, and somebody's grabbing the phone and calling up, you know, Commander Cody and, you know, saving the day. No, that stuff never happens. There's just way too many backups. Uh, you know, the, the there's too many aircraft in the sky to start, you know, playing stupid games like that. So there's a lot of contingencies were built into the system. It's just that, when, you know, the news would always report horrendous things because we slowed down aircraft. You know, we, the, the you didn't get to get off at the airport. You know, we, we put uh, hundreds of aircraft at ground delay in Los Angeles Center because we couldn't process the flight plans. And you would hear that as a major complete failure and shutdown. But, okay. you know, no safety was compromised. And you always hear that from the FAA. There was no safety compromise. And all, but the news is saying, oh, my God, every computer in the world shut down. There was no safety compromise, you know. So okay. that, that's the, the reason we get it that way. Okay. I have one other question. That's sure. Oh, to that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I never had uh, a real jerk controller. I mean, Everybody was really nice, and I was always taught that you are really polite to controllers. Um, that might be partly why I never experienced that. But I mean, did, when when you first become a controller, were you, um, you know, there, I'm sure that there's all kinds of different personalities. But did were there guidelines as far as what you could do and what you couldn't do um, if somebody was being kind of a jerk to you? Um, you know, did you have any discretion to? Um, you know, I know in my business and customer service, there were things that I could go to the mat for a customer, but if they were being an asshole, um, I would basically not go to the whole go the whole mat to them. I would, you know, basically do the minimum because they were being jerks. But <laughs> well, you know, you know what I'm saying. It is. It's also it is customer service. And and here's the answer. There's only one type of personality in the air traffic control business. That's type A. We, we are all type A and we are all jerks 
and we are complete assholes. We really are. I never ever experienced an asshole as far as a controller at, at, at approach departure center. None of it. I, I tell you what. As soon as he unclicks that microphone, after he said, "Thank you very much for your help today," blah blah. You know, as soon as that, goddamn blah blah blah. Yeah, everybody in the room gets to know what pilot was you know was being hard on him. You know, that pilot was being a pain in the neck. But as soon as he clicks that microphone and again says, you know, November one, two, three, four, five, Oakland Center, how can I help you? You know, right. I think we, it is an unwritten rule. There is no guideline. There is no book that says, you know, how you have to deal with people. However, you are going to be severely reprimanded, yanked off the sector if you were to actually go ballistic on somebody. And yeah, I'm, I'm like you, you know, uh, Every pilot I've ever talked to, I don't think I've ever had problems. I mean, there are some people, you know, and you, you the, the worst ones are the ones that come in demanding stuff, you know, and you, you've had a few, everybody, nobody liked United Pilots. And I couldn't figure out why, but it was because they'd always be asking for things, you know, and, and controllers are basically lazy people. I mean, we'd rather just sit there, you know, and, and bullshit to each other than talk to you guys. But... <laughs> But no, it's it's an unwritten rule. I mean, we know the sectors work better. Uh, air traffic control is much funner, you know, when everybody gets along. And, you know, everybody asks, it must be a stressful job dealing with all these pilots. I said, no, it's never stressful dealing with the pilot. Pilots are the best people in the world. What was stressful was dealing with other controllers. Okay. Like I said, there, in our building, at any one time, you know, during the day, we'd have 185 type A personalities working side by side. God. I, I tell you, I was the world's best air traffic controller, and I had the ultimate plan every single time. And I could not believe Joe sitting next to me would not accept my plan. <laughs> you know, and I'm yelling and screaming at him. And the pilots all they hear from me is, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm sorry, sir. San Francisco is oversaturated. You need to go into holding, you know, and blah, blah. You know, I would explain it to him what happens. The guy next, I'm not taking that stupid handoff from you. <laughs> That's not the way it's supposed to be. And we'd be having fights, you know, over unkeying the mic, but nobody would ever know that, you know, while we're, while we're working. But I, the air controllers was the only stress I ever felt. I wanted to punch people out left and right just because I know my plan was perfect and they would not accept. <laughs> and just, and just like the plan coming at me was perfect, I would not accept his pile of trash. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that was really the only stressful thing. The, the, the people who got stressed out doing air traffic controls were the people that actually believed that if they didn't do everything right, they were going to kill people. I mean, it, you couldn't live with that. I mean, you, you can't sit there and think that every decision I make is going to kill people or keep them alive. It didn't work that way. It was, you know, it was... The only job an air traffic controller has is to get rid of an aircraft as quickly as he can. He takes the handoff. The first thing in his mind is to get the airplane out of the sector, you know. Did you ever make any really big mistakes? Oh, God, yes. Uh, I, I had a pilot. I mean, I would, I would say maybe six weeks from retirement, I had a pilot save my ass. Um, <laughs> I, I had used the wrong rule for the wrong reason. I had a barren. Uh, flying over uh, over top Santa Rosa or over Napa, he was uh, going north or south to north at uh, 5,500 VFR, and he was a Baron. And I had a um, Citation C10 coming off of Napa that was going to be heading down towards Modesto and south. And I climbed by the speed to keep him below the VFR aircraft going northbound. And so he comes up, and I tell him, you know. I have a Baron at 5,500 northbound, maintain 5,000. Roger, he checks on. I tell the Baron, it says, I got a citation coming off a nap, climbing to 5,000. You know, advise them, you know, advise when you have them in sight. And I have both aircraft as, as say that they're in sight when they're in sight. Well, here was the bad mistake. The Baron saw the citation. And if the one pilot sees the other, you can do what's called VFR separation. I can tell the IFR aircraft to climb through the VFR aircraft if he can see the airplane. However, it was the Baron who was VFR who said he had the citation. And like an idiot, I came out and said, citation, you know, maintain VFR separation from the Baron, climb and maintain flight level 230. And as soon as it got out of my mouth, the Baron says, 
Senator TCAS just went off at 5,500. I'm going to maintain 5,000. And at that time, I realized my mistake. I used visual separation with the wrong aircraft. If the Baron had seen him, I could have told him to maintain visual and go, but it was the wrong way around. And literally, he saved my ass. I, don't, I have no idea if he would have hit him, but it would have been a screaming mess. It, they would have seen each other go by. So, yeah, that was the, the pilot saving my butt. And yes, I have made that mistake. Um, a few um, other ones. Yeah. Yeah, real quick. Um, um, we'll be looking at the picture here, and I'm kind of curious, uh, you know, the, what, uh, what year was that picture taken and what, you know, I think that's you, right? Or No, this is actually a friend of mine. That's Ian Fulmer. And the, okay. this is the fun part. This was Oceanic, okay? And yeah, I wanted the, to ask, what are some of the, can you describe some of the things that are going on here? Are those yeah. punch cards or what? What are we looking at? Okay. Um, as you can see the airspace there, okay, and if you see ZOA, that was Oakland Center. ZOA is Oakland Center, and the rest of it's our oceanic airspace. All right, so if you look behind Ian's back, there's what looks like bays, and then there looks like uh, strip holders in those bays, okay? Back when I joined in 1984, the round scope you see to his left did not exist. That is, That was a radar scope at the domestic sector. So throw that out and just look at the strips. We would put a strip in the bay for an aircraft crossing the ocean at every 10 degrees. So we would push the strip at 170 west, 160 west, 150 west, one for whatever the sector was, we would put a strip at every 10 degrees. And that strip would be a normal flight plan. It would tell us the aircraft's call sign, his speed, his altitude, and what fix he was going to every 10 degrees. So if he was crossing 170, he could be crossing it at 32, 52 north, 170 west, you know, and it would tell us exactly his route of flight. And we would put those strips in those bays. And so we would see, uh, I would have like, let's say if my bay was five, 10 degree sections long, I would have 10 or five bays, and I would have five strips for that same airplane but I would have a strip for his time at 170, his time at 160, his time at 150. And there would be his time. So I'd know when he left the, the 170 and when he was going to the 160. Wait, and, but the, wait a minute, wait, wait. Those strips that we're seeing, they look like, okay, uh, maybe with your mouse, if you could point, uh, what what are you talking? I mean, because I don't know the okay. inside of those, those are, are, are the strips. Are, are you seeing my mouse moving? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, those white things right there, those are strips. Okay, okay. Those, are, those are aircraft flight plan strips. And okay. uh, they, they would be printed out by the flight plan. Now, this scope uh, thing here, this is later on. This was a few years later. But when I first got there, we did not have this scope. Okay, this okay. scope is, is gone. All we have is these strips. And above our heads, we have maps. And okay. in our hands... Those uh, strips, are they printed on a printer right next to you? They just come out of some kind of a... We, we had a section that, that would involve two people. We'd have, let's see, one, two, three. We had about seven sectors. And then we have two people working at what was called the flight data position. And they would put in the flight plans because we didn't have computer tie-in at the time with the facility. We'd have to put everything manual into our, our, our own section of the wow. computer. And... They would now print out strips, and this was back in the day when we still had the uh, core, uh, the uh, punch hole strips. You know, the, they have the tabs on the side with the holes in them, and they would go through the key wheels. And they would have to tear off the the perforated ends, and then tear off the strips because they were in a continuous sheet. And then they would stuff them in a little plastic holder, and they would bring the five strips over to us, and then we put them in the bay. We could wow. tell if aircraft were going to be in conflict because we'd have five strips on every airplane. And then if he left one 10 degree line and went to the next one, as soon as he passed the next one, we tear down the strip on the previous oh. one so we didn't have to look there anymore. So it's basically like watching a chess game. Okay, yeah. but you, you have it physically in front of you. And the only thing that kept aircraft separated was the numbers on the where they crossed 170, their altitude, because if they were at the same fix at the same time, they better be 2,000 feet apart. Or, you know, they, they have to be at that, if they were going to the same fix, they'd have to be 20 minutes apart. So one would be crossing that fix at 1740 and the next one would be crossing at seven or 1800. 
So you would have that all written out. And as the aircraft are calling their positions, then you would be writing down the time they cross that position and they would give you an estimate for the next position. And you would write that estimate in. And then you would calculate it to see if that estimate was good because sometimes they'd give you a bad estimate. And here comes the funny part. We didn't talk to the airplanes. We never talked to the airplanes in the ocean. We had no physical contact with the aircraft in the ocean. What we had was aeronautical radio. They had two stations, one in Honolulu, one at Foster City. And they worked on HF radios. They, if you ever went to Foster City, there would be five towers on the coast. Um, on the other side, if you go over to the side, to the, uh, to the ocean side, there would be five tall towers with a single wire stretched across them. And that was the HF radio. And they would basically talk ham radio to the pilots. You know, that, that squeaky voice that has a funny oscillation in the background? They would talk to the pilots. The pilots would tell them their position, their altitude, what they're going to go to next, and what time they're going to be there in any request that they want to climb or a reroute. And they would call aeronautical radio. They would take it down and they would type it in, and then we would get the information on a teletype machine. I'll be so we, we get a hard copy printout. And if you have, I mean, one time I had 60 aircraft in sector uh, two, and I'm working 60 airplanes. So I'm basically working four times 60, you know, 480 strips in my bay. I mean, I have, wow. I have 10 bays just covered with paper, and I have the sheet of paper coming out of this teletype machine giving me positions and reports and requests. So you tear off, you know, after like 10 of them go by, you tear it off, you read them real quick, you transfer the uh, the times and all that. And then you would have to replot to figure out if airplanes are separated or not. Usually because uh, of the way flows went, all the aircraft would mostly be heading the same direction. The only one that was really bad was sector seven, which always had crossing traffic. You would have aircraft coming from the Orient, coming into the, um, to the domestic side, and you would have aircraft at about nine o'clock in the morning. You would have the trail end of the Orient traffic coming in. Oh, I think we uh -oh. lost. We lost Ken. Air traffic control just went down. <laughs> oh, we need some of those nuclear connections. Can't we lost you? Yeah. He'll be back. Yeah, I was saying he might not. Probably just went for coffee. You know, what's one of the things that's kind of interesting is he started the first slide showed the uh, airport and uh, the <clears throat> approach control for the airports for uh, San Jose, San Francisco, Oakland. Um, you got me back? Yeah, we hear you now. I don't know what happened, but my uh, connection dropped out and I went completely uh, waiting for a restart. Oh boy. All right. Well, we need some of those nuclear proof uh, you know, connections. <laughs> I would like to have that on my, uh, on my internet. All right, well. Um, okay, so, so going back, I was saying if you know if you got crisscrossing traffic and you're working on paper and you're you know taking times and you're trying to figure out if he's clear of one point while the other one's going in. So they came up that uh, we went I I went five years working that way. Then they came up what was called the ODAPS, it's the Oceanic Display and Planning System. This is when the fun starts. They had decided they're gonna write software to take the position reports and the, the times and the winds and all that and get a visual display on a screen so that we could actually see the, the airplane's representation. It wasn't a separation tool. It was just to show us where the airplanes were in relation to each other so we could calculate better and see who the traffic was with each other. So when they wrote ODAPs, they had this beautiful system going. We had these flat screens. There were 36 inches by 36 inches squares. Somebody in the bureaucracy of the FAA headquarters thought they could save money by taking the old PDDs from the domestic sectors, which just got upgraded to those three by three foot screens, and says, well, we could save money by giving the ocean our old radar screens, and you can make the presentation on that. 
and they gave him an award. They said, oh yeah, good, good, that's really nice. And they gave him an award. Well, IBM, who was writing the ODAP software said, what? You want us to take the display that's going to this 36 inch square screen that's already written and working and you want us to put it on this thing that does not know how to talk to our software. And they said, yeah. So just picking out numbers, basically saving $25 million, they cost $150 million to build an interim system to be able to take IBM's code, convert it to the old code that worked at the 9020 to make these PBDs run and get to put a square sector onto a round scope. When we had a square scope that it was already much cheaper. So we ended up with those round screens for five years and they they never quite worked. I mean, it was, ODAPS was hilarious. Uh, when they first brought it online, the very first night they brought it online, Dan Rom, a good friend of mine, was working uh, Sector 9. Just out of the fun of it, he types in end and the, and the system shuts down just completely stops. On the first night we're trying to implement this, he just types in N for the fun of it and it shuts down. They went ballistic on him and he just turned around and smiled. He says, aren't we supposed to be testing it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so after that, we tried, we tried everything. Desist, uh, cease, stop, everything. We typed everything that meant no go. <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and we tried to shut it down rapidly every time. So we got through that first night. They, they took out the end code which was the back door. So they took that out. So we couldn't shut it down that way. They brought it up again a few weeks later after further testing it. And it was on a midnight shift again when we don't, we, we didn't have a computer system. Uh, we were just doing handwriting strips all the time. So they brought the system up and we were putting in the flight plans. And I don't know what flight plan I put in, but I put in a flight plan from Guam and I, I picked some kind of fix or something. But as soon as I hit enter on that flight plan, the computer crashed. Oh, and at yeah. the time, I didn't know I was doing it, okay? At the time, we don't know why it crashed. So the, the team, they scramble around, they reset everything, they get the system back on, it says, put in the flight plan. So I type in the flight plan again, I hit enter and it crashes. So, you know, everybody else is putting in flight plans and mine crashed. I got so quick putting that flight plan and they finally had to give up because as soon as they said, put in the flight plans, I put it up, bam, crash. <laughs> you know? And two days later, they came over and told me, it says, you know, you were the one crashing the system. And I says, how come? And he goes, they said, the flight plan you put in had something, blah, blah, that did not work, and it crashed the system. They finally got that fixed, and then they got the apps working. Um, uh, just a second, I had a, what was the damn thing? Oh, man, I can't believe that. Oh, one of the funniest stories I ever had, and I'm going to forget it. I'll, hopefully, I'll come back to it. So um, we went five years with ODAPs, and uh, the only thing it did was it presented targets to you. It didn't actually tell you if, you know, if the winds weren't correct, if the airplane wasn't moving correct. Uh, it wasn't a true, so you could not say they were separated, but it just gave you a nice picture of what was going on. Then they came up with a, a new system to tie in with ODAPs, and that was called DataLink. And DataLink was, was to take out the aeronautical radio side of it. Now we could directly communicate with aircraft through the computer. We still couldn't talk to them, so we still had air ring, but we could type in things like change their altitude and the aircraft would get a whole clearance saying climb and maintain and they would respond back, do a data link. The funny thing about data link is data link requires satellites. And every antenna on every aircraft ever built was on the belly. Nobody ever thought about putting an antenna on top of the aircraft before they started data link. So the first day of data link, we didn't talk to a damn airplane and nobody could figure out why. And somebody finally, you know, later on, the joke was, why didn't we just have the airplane flip over to get us clearance? You know? <laughs> so they had to put what was a phased array antenna on top of the aircraft. So data link took about seven months to implement because they didn't think about putting a radar on there or uh, an antenna to get the, the radio signals. So we went with data link. And now we had uh, a new system for the FAA to taunt us with, and we had what was called the monkey button. And you would type out a clearance on data link, and, you would, and before you could send it to the, uh, the pilot, you would have to hit this red button, which we called the monkey button, and they would, you would hit it, and the computer would tell you whether or not the aircraft was separated or not. Remember I told you, ODAPS was not very good at separating aircraft. 
now we have a computer telling us whether or not ODAPS agrees with us, and none of us trusted it. So, you know, it says, we're not touching a damn monkey button. It says, if that thing goes red and I have a, you know, and I look at my map and I have a clearance, I said, I'm going to give it to him. And, and then it came down and says, no, you're not going to give it to him unless that button says green. So oh, God. that was ODAPS for a while. Now um, they took out ODAPS and they came out with the, the square screens and they came out with a better system and, the, and more reliable. What they have now is what's called ADS. Automatic independent surve uh, dependent surveillance. And what happens is now, remember what I was talking about, the transponder, whereas they have the bar on top of the radar screen that picks up the transponder and it correlates the two. ADS is a satellite that interrogates the transponder. So now it has the transponder plus the computer telling the thing. So it correlates it together. And now our separation has gone down from when I originally worked, our separation was 100 miles laterally. 20 minutes longitudinal, depending on the speed of the aircraft, that could be up to 120 miles and 2,000 feet. We have now reduced it to 30 miles and 1,000 feet. So all of a sudden now with the new, new computer systems and all that, we have reduced the oceanic air. I mean, we can fit literally millions of aircraft in the Oakland Ocean, whereas before we could only fit thousands. But uh, yeah, yeah the, the computer enhancements got drastically in the ocean. I mean, that is one place where computers are really taken over. I mean, when I first got there, we were using a whiz wheel, which is basically a rotary slide rule to figure out if airplanes were separated <laughs> by their speed and their, their times and all that. Like any um, computer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, it, the, the, the computer in the ocean was fantastic. In the domestic, uh, the computer's always been great because we've always been using that core software. As far as I know, the whole time I was there, that core software never left. I don't know how it is now, whether it's, I've been gone for 12 years, they might have been able to write new software. But what they have now, instead of a host or a mainframe computer, every sector has an individual computer. Basically, you're running a network, uh, an internal network, and then that network within the facility connects to the next center via the old link the way we used to have it with one mainframe talking to the other but now in the building there's no longer a mainframe we have individual computers every sector can be configured however they want it if you if you have you know individual settings you just type in your initials and bang the the, the sector set up exactly how you like it you can work any sector from anywhere before you had to be physically at a certain place to work a certain sector now you can you can sit all day in one place and work seven eight different sectors all day long hey ken Yes. My husband has a question. Um, sure. He wanted to know if you guys ever use latitude and longitude like with sailing to get positions. I mean, is that... That was the ocean. Know, pardon me? That was the ocean. Remember I was telling you every 10 degrees? That's lat longs. And so right. okay. we would work, you know, we, we would plot aircraft at uh, 42 north, 150 west, okay. going to 40. Yeah, so, yeah, we live by lat longs. And, you know, that's where I first learned... Question? Okay. That's when I first learned the difference between lat long. To me, you know, I, did, I never knew that a latitude was always the same distance. So you have 60, 60 miles between every degree of latitude, or latitude. And then longitude, you know, I always thought it was a square. But no, sometimes it's nothing. Sometimes it's, you know, 60 miles. So when you're down the equator, everything is measurable. And that's why I always thought it was funny in the ocean. All our maps are flat. Yeah. All our grid lines, grid lines are square. Right. So, so you have to know when you're plotting something out on a map, it's not correct. It's got to be. It's got to be a globe. It, right. You, because you know you you be plotting on a map, you're coming up with separation because you're working on a square map with a square grid. But you got to know where you're at. So if you you know you got to make sure both aircraft are in the same vicinity before you can start figuring out separation. Right. Um, the funniest thing is the Great Circle Route. You know, if you put a string between Tokyo and Los Angeles, you're going over Anchorage. Not a single airplane's ever flown over Anchorage. They fly almost, you know, somewhere about 30 degrees north of uh, Honolulu because of the jet stream. No airplane follows, you know, the, the Great Circle. They always, uh, or the direct line, they always fly the jet route. So we'd have airplanes coming out of Japan, flying almost down to Honolulu and then back up. And Honolulu, if you know, is in a direct line with Mexico City. So. Airplanes are coming from that, way up north, basically. The, what what about that? ones like going Los Angeles that goes over the poles to London? 
Uh, that's a totally different route. Uh, that's because uh, Europe is basically almost in line with us that way. So that's why they go that way. But uh, there is no winds going north and south. Winds are always east and west. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. It's, uh, the jet, the jet stream is always coming out of the west going to the east because the, the way the earth rotates. And there is no predominant winds going up and down. It's always, you know, crossway. So they go, they don't, uh, usually what happens is all aircraft departing out of here will usually go up around Gander, um, Canada, Nova Scotia, and uh, cross the Atlantic up there, regardless of where they're going. They'll, they'll, cross, they'll cross almost in the northern Atlantic. You, know, you very rarely have airplanes crossing the Atlantic in midstream from the United States. Even okay. if they come off of Miami, they'll head way up north, just to, okay. to stay within the winds. You had another question, Chris? Uh, is it true that if you were to mark all the uh, airports that you would calculate which way to the south? <laughs> so, Chris? He always comes up with these questions. Okay. He said, if you're at the North Pole, how would you calculate which way is south? But isn't every way south? That he's pointing at you. He <laughs> <laughs> Thank God we never worked the northern part of the world. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, I would say pick any direction and continue heading in that direction. You're going to be heading south. South. Just don't ever turn. <laughs> Did that answer the question, Chris? Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, and you had a slide that when you first started that showed the uh, approach to all the airports in the Bay Area. Let me get those up and I will explain all those approaches. Okay, that's the slide you're talking about, right? Yes. Okay, th this is what happens over the Bay Area, if you're ever wondering. We're not seeing it yet. We're not seeing your, can you share? Let me see, oh, you know what? When we crashed, that's what happened, okay. Okay, got it now? Yes, yep. there you go, we got okay. it. Okay, this, this is the Bay Area's approach control. This is departures and arrivals to the three major airports. It looks like a mess, but it's really, it's a procedural separation. You can almost fly this without air traffic control and get away with it. Um, starting out with Oakland, which is my favorite airport. If you're ever flying in the winter and you're heading down from the north, Seattle. So help me, if you ever go to San Francisco, you're in trouble. Go to Oakland. Fly into Oakland if you're coming from the north in the winter, because the north sectors are the first sectors to go in the holding for San Francisco on bad weather. So if you want to get into the Bay Area in bad weather from the north, go to Oakland. The, the airport is just as fast from Oakland as from San Francisco. So go there first. Do never, never fly into San Francisco unless you're coming from the east or from the south. If you're coming from the north, during bad weather, which is normally November or you know the, the winter, go into Oakland. Now, Oakland's arrivals, what they do is they'll come in from uh, wherever they're coming from, other than the far to the east. If they're coming from any line that's basically Reno all the way to Seattle, your route of flight is basically going to work you in over Point Reyes, then down to South Salido. No, I'm sorry. No, that's San Francisco's. You, you'll be coming in basically around Red Bluff, and then into South Salido, and then from South Salido, you're gonna to go to the Oakland. That's your route of flight. What's gonna happen is, as you're coming down from Reno near Red Bluff, you'll be turned direct to South Salido, and you'll start your descent. And by the time you get a beam mapper, you're gonna be at 5,000 feet, and you're gonna be heading towards South Salido, and you'll be handed off to Bay Approach, or NorCal, which is the Richmond sector. And as soon as they get a hold of you at the Richmond San Rafael Bridge, you're going to be turning left and you're going to go over the East Bay Hills and you're going to parallel Oakland Airport to the uh, north. And you're going to go, if you see the red line here, here's my pointer. This red line, this is over the East Hills and about Castro Valley, you're going to turn in and you're going to be established for Oakland Airport by Hayward and you'll be coming in that way. That's if you're coming in from the north. If you're coming in from the east, you're gonna either be coming in over San Jose or down through uh, Livermore and you'll come in 
through Castro Valley again, and you'll come in over Fremont, and then and, and we'll mix in with the, the guys coming in from the north. That's your Oakland arrivals. Oakland departures is basically standardized. This is We're looking at a normal configuration. Bad weather I'll talk about a little later, but a normal configuration, if you're departing Oakland, you depart straight out and you turn all over, you know, if you're going north, you'll turn towards Red Bluff. If you're going east, you'll turn towards Linden. If you're going south, you're going out to the ocean because you now have what's called the offshore route. You'll take that route and go down parallel to the coast until you get around um, about a line of Fresno, and then you'll turn into towards Santa Barbara and in. Uh, uh, so that's Oakland. San Jose, I'll do San Francisco instead because San Jose is like San Francisco. If you're coming in from Rhino Reno again, all the way to Seattle, you'll be coming in, going direct Point Reyes. Then from Point Reyes, you're going to go direct San Francisco. That's the route of flight. In reality, what's going to happen is you're going to go down to Point Reyes. You're going to get turned slightly north from that route, or not north, to the uh, right of that route. And you're going to come down basically over the Golden Gate Bridge. And you're going to be at 11,000 feet. When NorCal gets a hold of you, depending on what type of aircraft you are, but predominantly you're a heavy, you're a 747, uh, Airbus A380, you're usually a bigger jet. Most of the time you'll be turning to the right, and that's this line here. And you'll be going at 11,000 feet to the right, and the reason you're down here is because you are mingling in with the Orient traffic, which is coming in here, the Honolulu and Orient traffic, which are almost all big jets. Yeah. Uh, you're coming in mingling with that, and then you're mingling in with the LA arrivals. So you'll be on the right side of the runway. So usually, and it's also 2-8 left is the longer runway. So it's better accommodations for the larger jets. So if you're coming in on a 747 or, or an Air 380, you're almost always landing on the left. It's a longer runway. So you'll be coming in this way. They'll put you basically at the Golden Gate Bridge, they'll put you on a 140 heading. And that 140 will bring you out in this teardrop. You'll come out on a teardrop. Depending on if it's a beautiful day, what will happen is down around Woodside, build, uh, yeah, Woodside, you'll be turning left, almost parallel or perpendicular to the runway, and you'll be turning at a thousand feet lower than an aircraft that's coming in from the east, also turning left into your face. You'll be, let's say, at 5,000 feet, and he'll be at 6,000 feet, and you'll be flying towards each other. And prior to Dumbarton Bridge, you'll be looking out for the airplane. The, the controller will ask you, you know, report the, the traffic in sight. When they, when they see each other, this is when they both get turns towards the Dumbarton Bridge, and they'll level out on altitudes. And this is where you, if you sit over at um, the Elephant Bar, at you know at uh, Burlingame or if you're at the hotels there, you see these airplanes constantly coming in side by side. You know they're they're just beautifully lined up and they're they're flying together and they're, they're absolutely gorgeous. Sometimes you see one that looks like it's landing on top of the other one, but they're actually side by side. And these are called visual approaches: one on the right, one on the left, and we can handle 60 aircraft an hour that way. Wow. And that's that's normal flow. They're just pointing airplanes at each other. That's all they approach does is point airplanes at each other. Soon they see each other they turn them in and as soon as they're turned in they level them out the altitude and clear them for approach towers just the only thing that tower is doing is they have their runway one departures so they'll be taking off basically from the san bruno mountains towards oakland that's their departure runway that's their normal departures for all their domestic aircraft all your heavies going to the orient back to new york if you notice you always taxi across those runways and you go all the way down to the end and you you sit there and you look towards South San Francisco sitting there. So oh, okay. what local does is they, they will depart their aircraft in relation to their arrival stream. They don't mess with the arrival stream. Uh, Bay Approach or NorCal Approach sets up the arrival stream so they're all perfectly spaced. Local just clears the land, clear the land, clear the land, and then they sequence their departures in between. So they, they, have, they have good spacing. They, they have a minimum of three miles tail to tail and if they're side by side you know you, they're going to land together so there's 
you're going to be three miles from one pair to the next pair. So they'll always have three miles, so they have plenty of room. If they have an Airbus A380, they got a gobs of room because you need six minutes of departure between an Airbus 380. You need five minutes behind a 747. That's due to weight turbulence. So you got plenty of room. If you got one of those landing, they can depart 100 airplanes. I mean, they just go screaming out. So that's the San Francisco arrivals from the north. If you're coming from the east, you come in over Modesto, line up for Dumbarton Bridge. The south, you come in over Avenal, you line up for the, everything happens at the Dumbarton Bridge. It's, it's basically the, the, the San Mateo Bridge is the final approach. If you're not lined up by San Mateo Bridge, you're not going, you're doing a go around. San Jose is a totally different monster. If you're coming from the north, same thing as San Francisco, you're doing the same route, except you're coming in at 12,000 feet. So you're a thousand feet above the San Francisco arrivals. You're, you're going all the way down and you're basically into a vectoring to tie in to what's this light blue. And they just, wherever they can fit you in, they put you in. What's unique about San Jose is if you see this big blue bolt thing making this 12,000 foot loop, that's called a loop departure. And the reason they built that is because there's no physical way to depart out of uh, San Jose straight ahead and not run into the San Francisco arrivals. That's why they came up with the loop. Basically, as soon as you depart San Jose, and if you're going to Seattle, you're heading for Los Angeles and you don't know why. And you, what you're doing is you're climbing to get above the San Francisco arrival flow. Uh, San Francisco departures, as you can see up here north is all the purples. They basically go everywhere and stay above the Oakland departure. They, they have a climb procedure so that when they depart the runway, they're above the Oakland. If they're going south, they're above the uh, oceanic arrivals and below the north arrivals. This is the normal flow. Now, when you turn everything around and you put Oakland landing at runway uh, 11 instead of 29, if you ever notice, if you live in the East Bay, Airplanes are basically coming right over my house. I know exactly when San Francisco turns their runways because every Oakland arrival comes over my house, goes down towards the uh, Bay Bridge and makes a left turn and then goes in. Do um, they change those runways all at the same time? Or are they all talking to each other so that when the runways change because of weather that everybody does it at once? Yes, San Francisco determines the runway layout. Okay, San Francisco Tower, when they cannot do the winds anymore, they will call up NorCal Approach and, Nor and tell NorCal Approach they're going to be switching the runways and they'll give them a time. They'll never say we're switching them and do it. They'll give them a time. <laughs> so we'll, we'll have, because, you know, because the thing is, is like I said, uh, the centers have control of the airspace. Nobody does anything without center approval. Right. So Tower calls up Approach. Approach calls up center and says, San Francisco's gonna reconfigure uh, to the uh, Southeast plan. And they go, center says, okay. They go to all the controllers, says, we're going to Southeast plan, all arrivals go into holding. So every arrival everywhere, except the arrivals from the East. The East keep moving, but everywhere else from the South to North, everybody goes into holding until we have the runway switched around. So up North, if you're going into San Francisco, what's gonna happen? You're gonna go into holding. So that's why you pick Oakland because Oakland just zips right on through because now all of a sudden you're lined up straight up for the runway. So they're not gonna put you into holding for Oakland. You're now the number one arrival. You were gonna be going down the, the, the corridor and then flipping around back up and landing. And all of a sudden you're number one in the pattern. So who's ever at sector 41 going to Oakland is now the number one aircraft. So that's why we never go into holding for Oakland. And Unless if we just handed them off, we don't know about that airplane. And they've already taken them to go into the, the weird configuration. And our first guy that has not gone been handed off is now the number one aircraft. So he's traveling in. So Oakland switches right away. They have no problem switching because they're a one a runway one runway show. So all they basically have to do is stop taking arrivals here and start taking them there. And every airplane that's lined up on the, on the south end now has to turn around and taxi to go to the north end to take off. So San Francisco now usually gets about a 20 minute window to, to reconfigure. What they do is they will accept all the aircraft that are in NorCal's airspace because NorCal does never hold, they have no room for it. They'll just accept a normal configuration, everybody regardless of the winds because the winds never change that fast. They usually gradually work up and they know, you know, we can't handle this anymore. We're gonna, so they can still land, they clear out all the runways 
And as soon as the land air, last aircraft lands, they they reconfigure all the airspace. Everybody, you know, they all have buttons to reconfigure the airspace because now the whole new approach control uh, approaches come in. So they flip the runways over, and now the east ones are all lined up, still going because they're st they're still landing. They're landing runway one nine now. So basically, what they're doing is they're coming in over Oakland and landing across the bay. So all those guys that were coming in from the east, they're not now landing for 28, just make a slight right turn, start heading towards Oakland, and then as they get over the top of Oakland, they'll make a left turn and go in. All the Oakland departures now that are facing this traffic coming at them are kept below them. So they'll depart out of Oakland, stay down below until they clear that line, and then they shoot up and they find ways out. Departures are never a problem. It's always the arrivals, because the nice thing about departures, nobody's ever going to the same place. Arrivals, everybody's going to that runway. So it's always harder to land airplanes than it is to take them off. So it's always an easy way to get the people out. So now, since we're landing runway 19, they have to get the eastbound stream in going in. The northbound stream, what we do is we, we have a stack of airplanes point, uh, over Point Race starting at uh, now 9,000 feet instead of 11. And we have the first guy flashing to NorCal. And when they are ready to take the handoff, they'll take our first guy flashing. They'll take the, we'll ship the airplane over and they will head him basically from Point Reyes straight south to Woodside. And he'll go all the way down to Woodside then make a left-hand turn, fly all the way back up to the basically the Presidio, make a right-hand turn, fly over Oakland and then continue a right-hand turn and then come in over Oakland and get mingled in. So everybody's now being mingled in over Oakland rather than down by over Palo Alto. Yeah. Uh, San, Jose, San Jose guys are, I, to this day, I really don't know what happened to San Jose and Southeast plan. I have, you know, I never worked San Jose airport. I, my sector did not go that far south, so I never looked at it. So I never really cared. All I know is they, they still do their same exact routing for the Southeast plan. They go over point rate. San Francisco, San Jose at 12,000. So I never cared about them guys. So I never learned what happened to them. Um, we have had airplanes flying all over the Bay Area when they when they first switched the, the runways until they can get a smooth flow in. And uh, it's and then the other hard thing is switching back to normal runways. We have to go back into holding, get everybody cleared out, switch the runways and start up all over again. So this traffic pattern, it looks confusing as hell, but it's mostly procedurally set up. It works beautifully. I mean, uh, I, can, I can sit, you know, down at Point Isabel, walking the dog and look at airplanes and tell you exactly where everybody's going and what they're doing. You know, I mean, it's, it's once, you, once you get familiar with the pattern, it's, it's a really cool thing. Sometimes, sometimes, you know, I expect an airplane to turn one way and he goes the other way and I go, who the hell thought of that? You know, somebody went direct without approval, you know, I mean, some controller got a wild hair up his butt and turned the guy direct to what's normal, the normal flow. So every so often you see some controller with a little in initiative and ingenuity and he did something funny. But most of the time, the procedure is always the same. It, it all looks the same. Any other questions on that? I mean, I, I, can, I can talk forever. That's the problem. It was an absolute great job. Absolutely loved it. Like I said, the only stress was uh, other controllers. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing so I can. Okay, let's see. You're, stop sharing. There we uh, go. Can, yeah. Can, can, hi, I'm Carol. I came late yeah. to the party, but I'm glad to catch most of it. Uh, I had heard that Half Moon Bay was a very busy airport with corporate traffic. Is that true? And how does it integrate with the pattern you just showed us? Uh, it's usually below. Um, uh, it's, it's not as busy as you think. It's busy certain times of the year. It's same as Napa and Santa Rosa. Whenever we have NASCAR in, like Laguna, Laguna Seca is a big thing for Half Moon Bay and uh, Salinas and all of that. Um, Napa, I mean, when you got the Bohemian Grove and uh, NASCAR come in, you have every Learjet in the world and Gulfstream show up at those two airplanes. So yes, it can be busy, but it's uh, only you know small times of the year, and there's special rules involved when things like that happen. You know, uh, we don't allow VFR flights uh, to go on around the Napa Airport. You know, during NASCAR and stuff like that. Half Moon Bay. Uh, 
Uh, that air that airport is worked by NorCal Approach, so we don't physically work that airplane or that airport. But every time I flew into it, it's you know basically it's been a clear runway, and I don't actually fly. I fly with friends, but because uh, there's a great brewing company at the end of the runway there, so we love going into that airport. <laughs> but it. It's, it's an uncontrolled tower, so it's not even a controlled, you know, there's not even a, an IFR procedure into it. So I I don't know how busy it is, but I have never, every time we've flown into it, it's not been busy at all. But if, but Napa, Napa is one of the busiest airports around for the simple reason it's the, the training base for Japan Airlines and Korean Airlines. And if you ever wondered how they work it there, is they will take their hirees, young kids, you know, 20 years, 21 years old, and they'll send them to Napa, and he'll learn two things at Napa. He'll learn how to fly an airplane and how to speak English to an air traffic controller. He might not be able to speak English to another person, but he can speak to an air traffic controller. He'll know all the phraseology. He'll learn how to fly an airplane. It's always a Baron. They have a fleet of Barons there, and he'll, he'll learn those two things, and once he learns those two things, they'll ship him off to Moses Lake up in Washington and put him in a 747. They'll train him for that, and then they'll send him back to Japan, and he's now the right seat. He's never flown any other aircraft in the world other than a Baron and a 747, and that's how they train their pilots. And uh, I spent a year at Iwakuni, Japan, working uh, the, the airfield there. And we had uh, two airfields. We had the uh, the runway and we had a sea lane. We had uh, three sea lanes out there. And we had two Jap or three Japanese patrol squadrons. And then we had a Marine Corps air station there. And I got real good talking to the Japanese pilots. I mean, I could understand everything they said. So anytime uh, anybody had something weird coming from a Japanese student because the nice thing about Napa is the, um, the pilot instructors will not interfere. They will let those pilots mumble all day long to get whatever they need to teach them so they don't interfere. So I've had so many controllers say, Kent, get over here. What's this guy asking for? You know, and they ask him to repeat it and say, oh, he wants the ILS at uh, Chico. Oh, thanks. Because <laughs> I had gotten so used to talking to Japanese pilots that I, I was the go-to guy. I didn't know how to fly an airplane. I didn't know Japanese, but I could understand their accent. I could, I could understand their broken English. So Napa was uh, the Koreans and uh, the Japanese were always there training. And also, you know, unbeknownst to a lot of people, also the terrorists that did 9-11 trained there. Because oh, the, the, there, there was a big training school at Napa. Napa is a huge school for flight, uh, for uh, commercial flights. Wow. And it, it's one of the funnest airports to work to because if, if you, you know, a center controller there's two types of center controllers. There's the ones that work centers and those who wish they worked approach control. And at sector 40, we had approach control because we had Santa Rosa, Napa, and up north, we had Chico and Redding. And we actually got to do approach control. You know, we did radar vectors and all that. So it was always fun. So I loved having those barons in because they always wanted something difficult. They always want, you know, hands-on, a lot of work being done. So you actually got to feel like uh, Tom Kuzak in that movie, Pushing 10. You know, you're, you're just bouncing out instructions. And you get an airplanes turning around, and you're, you're really cool looking sector, and nobody wants to relieve you. <laughs> nobody wants to get near you. So, I have a question. Sure. When, in, in any of your military situations, did anybody buzz the tower like, to, uh, like in Top Gun? Uh, no, nobody buzz the tower, but I did. Uh, Eddie Wakumi, here's a, another great story. I'm sitting in the tower all by myself on a Sunday afternoon and I'm watching Japanese television. This is our favorite thing to do at Iwakuni is to watch Japanese television because we would always turn off the sound and we would just dub in whatever we wanted to say. And we used to always watch a show called The Emperor. So I'm up in the tower on a Sunday afternoon all by myself watching The Emperor and just making jokes. And I get this Air Force, uh, F-4, from Kadena Air Force Base and he's going back home from the south. He was doing something down south and he's flying by and he was talking to Hiroshima Approach, and he asked if he could talk to us, Zio Kuni Tower. So I got him on frequency. He says, Zio Kuni Tower, this is, I'm just going to make up a call sign. This is Air Force 123. Uh, I noticed you have a resting gear there at the field. I said, yes, sir, we do. He goes, can I try it? I said, sure, sir. There's nothing going on. And I put him into the pattern, and I, I told Hiroshima, says, the airplane's going to stay with me for a while. I put him in the pattern, and he's just working the pattern. Powder. And I told him, it says, uh, I have to get the crash or the uh, arresting gear people out here. 
before I can set, you know, to set it up before he can land. He goes, no problem. You know, I'll just do the, the pattern. So he's going around in the pattern. So I call up the arresting crew and say, hey, guys, you bored? They go, yeah. I says, I got an F4 out here. wants to do a trap. And I goes, oh, great. They all scramble out to their vehicle. They get out in the middle of the field. They start setting up the arresting gear. The reason we have arresting gear, just like an aircraft carrier, we have a wire that stretches across the runway. That's really is because an F4 cannot land on a 10,000-foot runway without a chute or a resting gear. They need 12,000 feet to roll out. So we had a resting gear because we were only 10,000 feet long. So in the middle of the field, we have um, the, the, the standard arresting gear. And then 1,000 feet from each runway, we have the E-28 emergency arresting gear. And then at the end of the runway, we have the E-5 chain gear, which is basically a wire stretched across the, the end of the runway and an anchor chain for a battleship stretched out uh, onto yeah. it. So if it catches that, it's riding anchor chain. So I explain all this to the pilot. I tell him the entire setup of the runway and what's going on. And he goes, Roger. And I told him, you know, you have to fly beyond the first set of wires, which is the E-28 at 1,000 feet, and engage the gear at 5,000 feet. And he goes, Roger. And I said, and if you miss the, the, the middle of the field, there's another wire at 4,000 feet and one at the end of the runway. However, do not attempt those. Go full power and get off the runway. And he goes, okay, got it. So we got everything set up. It's F4. I clear him for an arrested landing, runway two. I gave him the win in the altimeter. And he came in a little, little early. You know, he, he came in about mostly Marine and Navy pilots. They'll fly into the wire. I mean, they're basically touching the ground 10 feet in front of the wire and looking cool. The Air Force pilot touched the runway like 2,000 feet from the wire. And he's rolling along, you know, and I'm going, oh, this is lame. And, and his gear misses the wire. So I, I start yelling, bolter, 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 go around. And he goes, Roger. I, and he, he keeps rolling. I says, E-28, 1,000 feet. Roger. And he goes right over the E-28, and he misses that. The, hit, the hook skips again and goes over the top. And I says, E-5 chain gear, 1,000 thousand feet and he goes roger and he goes right in the five chamber goes off the runway hits the, the the basically it's gravel tar and this anchor chain and he goes off the end of the runway and sinks into it and the anchor goes after him so he's now 500 feet beyond the runway and he's sitting in the mud and he goes tower i think i'm gonna need to tow and i said you you're kidding sir <laughs> i got into so much trouble for allowing an air force f4 to trap on the runway and he got i don't know what kind of trouble got it but i don't think he's flying anymore but it took him a week to get the airplane out of the end of the runway oh, and, yeah. and go back they didn't damage him anything but yeah nobody buzzed the tower but we did have the air force make a splash at our runway <laughs> Oh, that's, that's really something. Uh, and the, the other thing about buzzing towers, at 29 Palms, uh, like I said, we had an expositionary airfield, and we only had transit aircraft there, but every six months we'd have a major training operation because these pilots had to learn how, how to work on an aluminum runway. So they would go out and make bombing runs, and the bombing ranges were right behind us by about five miles. And at the end of the exercise, two weeks of this, they would take every airplane they could find that was flying – that could carry weapons and load them up with whatever was left that hadn't been used at operation, take them all off at the same time, and then they'd fly in a formation behind the tower by a couple of miles and drop everything. And everything would go up at once. And talk about fireworks. I mean, we had, I mean, that was the best flyby we ever had. You know, you had like 10, 12 aircraft going by with every munition they could get and just dump it all over the bombing range and just light up the sky and then all come back in it was usually our busiest time because it's the only time we would depart that many airplanes and arrive that many aircraft at the same time but, yeah yeah, well, 29 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah let me go ahead and mine and go ahead and uh start the recording we can continue on chatting a little bit longer if you want but sure. i will go ahead and formally uh you know end the meeting by uh ending the recording and uh, uh thank you very much really enjoyed the talk but uh, stick around. I'm just going right. to um, end the recording and uh, end the meeting for now. But thank you again. You're welcome. Thanks, guys.